Preston Mosque website or their Facebook page. Preston Mosque is also called Umar ibn Khattab Mosque. And, you know, the, if you need to review and update yourself so you understand today's lesson, you have to go back and listen to those other lessons as well. Just in case you might have some other questions as I talk, then we would have answered them in the other lessons. Some people, they listen to a talk, a lecture, or a presentation, and it's only part of a big series. And then they're left without the answers, and some people miss out or they don't bother to listen to the whole information. So I urge you, inshallah. Today, I'm going to talk about the relationship between Qadr and what we call Dua, Istikhara, Dreams, and a few other questions in between them. Questions that people get confused about when they think about fate and destiny. The first thing I want to introduce today's topic with is the following. My brothers and sisters, Islam came to teach us that a Muslim uses his intellect and his reasoning. Islam did not come to us so that we can close our eyes and not use our minds, our brains. Quite the opposite. It is when the time that people used to worship idols and put their trust in celestial planets, statues, deities. Islam came and stopped all of this nonsense. When people used to believe in pessimisms, bad omens, they see something, they say this is a bad omen. They see somebody, something happens to them, they say it's because of him or her. They used to do little things, they used to buy talismans and do little tricks. And if something happens, they predict what's going to happen next. There's a name for it in Islam, it's called Tiyarah. It's done in many forms, even till today. There are people who call themselves psychics, tarot readers, palm readers. There are people who still believe in zodiac signs. Astrology. They look at the stars and they think that their patterns during the year tell them about their future or their personality. Born in January, you're a this. Born in February, you're a that. And he talks about your personality. <laughs> this is like 10,000 10, years ago. Allah eradicated that through the Prophet Ibrahim. And yet people still do it. And these are people highly intelligent in areas of science or maths or engineering. or They, 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 they invent... They, These people fresh, and they still believe in this stuff. It's like the humans always want something to try and predict their future. When this is impossible, you cannot predict your future. Nobody knows their future, my dear brothers and sisters. And even among the Muslims today, I'm going to touch on this, where they put heavy emphasis on supernatural signs. Too much emphasis on dreams. Too much emphasis on, you'll know about it, istikhara, for example. Too much emphasis. Too much emphasis on relying on Allah's will, qadr, and not doing anything themselves. Too much emphasis on God will heal me without resorting to medicine which Allah created for us. So, Muslims today have kind of fallen into these traps as a result of ignorance, lack of knowledge about qada and qadr, and belief in Allah, what it means, and mixing it with other past beliefs, Greek theology, astrology, the ancient Babylonian beliefs, They mix it with other religions, Buddhism, Hinduism sometimes. Such as when somebody goes 
to the grave of a saint. They call him a saint. We don't know if they're a saint or not. And they think that by calling upon that dead person, they're going to help them in their life. When they forgot, that same dead person, even if they were a saint, and when they were alive, they got sick and they couldn't prevent the sickness from themselves. They died. They couldn't do anything about that. They had problems. They couldn't get rid of those problems. Yet these people go to them to say, help me get rid of my problem. When they died of those problems. There are people who believe in good luck charms. Charms. They hang them up. And they believe in them that they will help their future or they tell them something about themselves. The list goes on. So we are here, inshallah, to give your brains and your hearts rest and ease and to bring you back to reality. And that Islam is not about illogical, always, like there are some illogical things such as the way we make wudu. Why would you wipe over your sock? Why would you clean your feet when you lose your wudu? These are acts of worship. They're a spiritual side of it. But they have nothing to do with predicting your future, deciding your fate. Based on that, you make decisions in life. You wait for a coin or a feather or a dream catcher or a, a blue, the blue eye that some people wear or even the Qur'an. They put the Qur'an little pouches and wear it around them. Or Ayt al-Kursi, some people believe if you wear it, it's, somehow it's going to do something for you. That's like the example of having a headache Headache. And then you buy Panadol from the pharmacy. You keep it in its packet and wrap it around your neck. Is your headache going to go if you wrap around Panadol around your neck? Can you imagine someone? That would be a sight to see. Someone believing, I'll wrap the Panadol around my neck and my headache will go. Same with the Quran. Yeah, it was sent down so you can recite it, read it, and learn from it. And a lot of people, they memorize the Quran, which is amazing. But they forget to understand the essence and the teachings and the message that the Quran has. Everything in Islam is precisely real. We use our brains, we use our re reasoning. Reason to reason is mentioned more than 30 times in the Qur'an. Using our brain, using our intellect, believing in cause and effect, the laws that Allah created in this world. <laughs> and if, for example, if I say, ask you, or if you ask someone who's hungry or thirsty, Go and drink if you're thirsty. Go and eat if you're thirsty. And then they say to you, Allah has already written and decided my food and drink in my life. So if he has willed it, the food and drink will come to me. And then they don't do anything. Can you imagine someone saying that? That would be another sight to see. Wouldn't it? Pretty foolish. No one will say that in their right mind. Yet, they'll say, I'll just wait for Allah's qada and qadar. And then they don't do anything. Or if something goes wrong, they say, uh, you know, they don't, they don't look at what they did wrong at all. Or whether they did right. Some, and and this, this happens to some Muslim populations these days where they just sit down and do nothing anymore. Not productive anymore, don't seek anymore. Everything got to do with materialism and dunya. They put it aside completely. And some people, some Muslims have resorted to, just to rely on tawakkul. Just rely on Allah, ya akhi. Just rely on Allah. What does relying on Allah mean? Relying on Allah means that you take measures as well. You research, you investigate, you do your part, you take steps, you seek advice, you learn, you research, you use your brain. All of that is part of tawakkul. All of that is part of relying on Allah. Who created your intellect? Who created the means? Who created the medicine? Who created the knowledge? Who created the physics? Allah created that. Why? So you can seek it and use it. <laughs> but we have to wait for something. Because human beings' nature, we've got to wait for something out of this world. And when Allah shows us something out of this world, the more we see it, we get used to it, and then we, no longer, we forget that it was a miracle. You know, the mere breathing of oxygen is a miracle that Allah created, but we don't pay attention to it. Why? Because it's now normal to us. We have to wait for something like what they said to the prophets. Bring down the angels. Bring down God. Bring down... Many miracles happened before and they died off with them. 
We have, alhamdulillah, the Qur'an with us. And it's full of guidance and reasoning, ya akhi. So a Muslim lives their life in between, taking precautions, using their intellect, taking steps, learning, ad getting advice, and coupled with that, they never forget to rely on Allah with it. They never forget to have worship. They never forget to make dua. They never forget that nothing can happen without His will. But at the same time, you cannot do anything without His will. And that all cause and effect is part of His will too. So keep going. Allah says, وَقُلِ اعْمَلُوا Say, O Muhammad وسلم, Say to them, اعملوا, Act, Do, Move, فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ Allah is looking and judging your actions. Sayyid Allah is looking at your actions. Actions are all part of the process, the whole qadr, everything. So my brothers and sisters, I thought I'd make that introduction very clear. Next, I want to talk about a little bit the laws of conditions and causes since we have introduced that. In Arabic, in, in the Sharia, it's called asbab. The reasons that things happen that we can use common sense to predict. If I put my hand in the fire, it's going to burn. If I starve myself and don't eat, I'm not going to get nourishment. If I am thirsty, I drink. If I don't, I'm not going to get quenched. If I don't learn, I will stay ignorant. And so on. If I don't seek, I will not reach. So, a question that some people ask me is this. If Qadr is written and decided, why bother to take precautions and pay attention to causations? Why? If I'm going to fall in that hole, why should I even think of not walking next to it? I'll go walk next to it, and if it's written, I'll fall. Yani, these are all sights to see, aren't they? They're just foolish. I will drive my car and I will not pay attention to the road or the steering wheel or anything. If I'm meant to crash, I'll crash. Isn't that right? I want to get married, but I'm not going to search or do any investigation or ask. If Allah wills it, she'll come to me. He'll, and, and she's thinking the same. Nobody comes to anybody after. Ya akhi, we have to seek. And this is all part of Qadr. Causations and precautions are part of Qadr. Allah wrote causes and precautions as well. Allah wrote decision-making actions as well. All of them together, coupled. You can't understand that. I can't. But Allah does. This is His work. Medicine, for example, Rasul said yeah, that they said to him, Ya Rasul Allah, Ara'ayta you know medication that we take for the purpose of helping us heal and treat us, to treat us. And spiritual healing that we seek. Are they enough? Yani... What does that mean compared to Qadr? Where, where does this fit? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hiya min Qadrillah. This is part of Allah's Qadr. Medication, medicine, is part of Allah's Qadr. And the classic story of Umar radiallahu anhu and the great plague of Amawas. You heard of that one? We, we probably repeated that so many times during COVID. The plague of Amawas. At the time of Umar, he was the Khalifa. And there was another great companion among the ten, Promised Paradise, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah. He was in charge of the people in Amawas, in greater Syria. And a plague erupted and spread. And Umar, he made istikhara. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for counsel and guidance. And he went there. But before he got there, he asked about the state of the people of Amawas. They said to him, they have a plague, ta'un, ya Umar. And it's spreading. Then he camped outside. 
and got up in the morning and said, nobody enters and nobody is allowed to exit. Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, came out and said, Afirarun min qadarillahi ya Umar? Are you running away from the will and predestination of Allah, ya Umar? He hadn't entered yet. Umar radiallahu anhu said, Law kana min ghayrika ya Abu Ubaidah. I wish someone else would have said this statement other than you. Meaning, I don't want to embarrass you, Abu Ubaidah. You're among the scholars. I wish someone else would have asked this question that was not really thought out well. Ya Abu Ubaidah, Naam, afirru min qadarillahi ila qadarillah. Yes, I run away from one qadr of Allah and I enter into another qadr of Allah. This is all part of the process. He took the action and the causes and investigated. And the fact that he made that decision and went there, this is also part of Qadr. Allah had written, Omar will make the decision, will investigate and do the right thing, and it will save him from that and go into that. This is all part of Qadr. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters? We don't eliminate one and accept the other. It's all together. Tayyip. The next question. Why has God made me this way? Some people ask. They get frustrated. Something goes wrong in their life. Something, they're created a certain way. They have a particular personality. They're either male or female. They're a particular color. They're a particular height. They're a particular look. All these things. Why did Allah make me this way? They blame it on Allah. And what's funny is that when things are going the way they want it to go, we often don't ask, why is Allah making it all good then? We, we don't think about that. We don't think about the good, but only when the bad happens. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we accept the way Allah made us. There is a reason for that and a purpose. Some people say, why did so-and-so die of my family and I kept, I was alive. Why not me? Some people, they, they say that. We say to them, because Allah has written a purpose for you, there's a need for you to continue living. When your time is finished, when your need in this world and your qadr is done, then you will return back to Allah. But the fact that you're still living, it means that you are still needed and you are valued and you have a purpose in here. And that is why the Rasul said, there is nothing that happens to a believer except there is good in it. And they never assume of Allah to do an action except it has to be good and there is a blessing. Sometimes we say, why did Allah do this to me? Or why did Allah allow it? But we fail to ask the question, again, when things go well, and when we seek the pathway to successful action, we don't say, Allah. We say, we did it. I'm happy. I'm good. We don't question anything. My dear brothers and sisters, sometimes it is our doing. Sometimes I say, why am I in this situation? Why did Allah put me in this situation? Ya go back, go backwards, follow your steps. Sometimes you've got to look at, did you put yourself in this situation? But no, some people can't accept that. Look at your own actions. Allah never wants bad for us, ever, ever. Sometimes we blame Allah. And there are verses in the Quran where Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ Say to them, it is from yourselves. Yes, it is Qadr of Allah, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the means for it. But you made that decision. Not Allah, you made that decision. You chose. Learn from it. And there is always blessings in learning from our mistakes and teaching others. This is how we grow as humans, brothers and sisters. So a Muslim is never, should never be pessimistic. What's pessimistic? Assuming negatively about our future or about our cause or about the reasons a Muslim finds a way to think optimistically you can get into that habit inshallah my brothers and sisters there is no pessimism in Islam there are no such thing as bad luck charms bad omens as I started my talk today 
sometimes some Muslims, they put Qadr, they put, they get Qadr, they, they assume Qadr, and they force it into a situation, and they themselves say, Qadr did this. Yani, I had no power myself. They interpret it their own way. When there is nonsense and no common sense, like when the example of when we, you know, a person, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, you can't imagine that a person will drink poison and say that after they got sick or vomited or died, you know, and then says, this was the qadr of Allah. Okay, you did it to yourself. Allah merely wrote it and knew that you're going to make that decision, but he didn't want it for you. Had you chosen not to, you wouldn't have. So my brothers and sisters, لا, uh, there is no qiyara in Islam. There is no pessimism in Islam. And there is no such thing as basing it on uh, supernatural imaginations and fantasies that we make up. Sometimes a person is very desperate for something. And all the common sense around them tells them, move away. <laughs> Don't do it. And sometimes they want to do something and they just want to do it, right? So everything's, and then they look up into the sky and see a cloud. A cloud. A cloud. You can make a thousand different images and pictures out of it. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's an illusion. They see something. Say, ah, oh, that's my sign. How do you know that was your sign from Allah? See a cloud, a cloud. Let's say they saw a, a picture of a dog. Allah, that's like that beautiful dog I saw the other day. This is a sign. Subhanallah. Sometimes a young person is walking down the street, stops, looks on the other side, says, Allah, that's the girl of my dreams. There she goes. She vanishes. He looks at the ground. He was stepping on a 20 cent coin. He picks up the 20 cent coin. He goes, this is my good luck. Keeps it in his pocket. Goes to some shop. Coincidentally sees her there again. It's the good luck coin. The 20 cent coin. 20 cent coin. The Aussie 20 cent coin is his good luck charm. Probably bases on that. Goes and asks for her. Gets married. Even though every sign about her is no. Gets her into a toxic relationship. Something. <laughs> yeah. Their deen is gone, let's say, or the other way around, so that sisters don't think we're picking on them. Sister does that with it. Yeah, these charms and these good luck and bad luck and omens. A Muslim never goes by that, ya akhi. I'm just giving you general examples. And that's for everything else in life. Al-tiyaratu shirk. Prophet said that basing things on, on tiyara, basing things on good luck or bad luck circumstances or actions or any kind of voodoo or, 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 or whatever supernatural things that people do is shirk. You are making shirk with Allah because you're putting that power in this thing that it's going to predict your future. Psychics, palm readers, all that rubbish. My brothers and sisters, the next question is, if everything is written and decided by Allah, how come we make dua? What is dua? Dua is basically praying to Allah, speaking to Allah, calling upon Allah for many reasons. Either you request something, or you just want to speak to Allah, or you just want to thank Allah, or you, just, or you, or you feel you want to complain your worries and sadnesses to Allah, or you want, just want to get close to Allah. Dua is done for many reasons. It's closeness to Allah in every way. And dua is worship. Our entire salat is dua. And when we pray to Allah anytime you want, call upon God, we also call it prayer. Dua. Supplication. Calling upon Allah. Connecting with Allah. So the question is, if everything is written and decided, why do we need to ask Allah? Why do we need to call upon Allah? Just wait and let it happen. You see, brothers and sisters, the answer again. 
Allah willed, Allah willed and wrote both things that what's going to happen to you and that you're going to make dua. He knew in the future something's going to happen or not happen because of your choice of what you did. And he knew you're going to make dua and that's going to correct a pathway or do something or bring you something or some other course is going to be shaped because of the dua that you made to Allah. Now you might be thinking, what? I have the power to shape things? No. You're doing dua, meaning you're calling upon Allah. So Allah is shaping things. But He is the one who's deciding if He will accept your dua or not. Or put it the way you want it or in His way. Or give it to you now or delay it till later. Or reshape it in the way that He sees fit. So at the end of the day, when you make dua, you are not really shaping anything. You are using the cause that Allah gave you, which is a gift. Allah gave you this gift to make you feel like an individual who is, who is blessed, honored, valued by Allah, and so that you can turn to Allah and get closer to Him. Yeah, and I'll explain dua a little bit more, inshallah. Now, what is my evidence that dua has a role in, in Qadr. In fact, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, إِنَّ الدُّعَاءَ يَنْفَعُ مِمَّا نَزَلَ وَمِمَّا لَمْ يَنْزَلِ Dua can benefit, can benefit you, whether it is for something that has already been decreed and came down from Allah, and it will benefit you, against anything which has been decreed, but it has not yet come down, had not yet happened. فَعَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ بِالدُّعَاءِ Rasul Sallallahu said, O oh, worshippers of Allah, make dua. Dua has an effect on predestination. How? The Prophet, peace be upon him, also said, لا, He said, لا يزيد في العمر إلا البر. Nothing increases in your lifespan, your age, except al-bir. Al-bir means when you do good unto others, but especially your parents. In another hadith it says, those who are dutiful to their parents, their lifespan may be prolonged in goodness. And those who connect their family ties, their lifespan is affected, it grows longer. Another hadith says that if you connect your family ties and you're good to your parents, then your rizq, your provision is increased and blessed. And nothing repels qadr, predestination, except for dua. How does that make sense? Dua repels predestination, your lifespan that was written for you when you were in your mother's womb. If you're good to your parents, suddenly the, the will is changed and your life is longer. Your rizq, what you're supposed to get in your life, your provision, your sustenance, suddenly, because you're good to others, good to your parents, family ties, you get more. How does that make sense? Again, the answer is in qadr itself. It was the qadr of Allah that dua will change the original qadr. How? I'll give you the statement of the scholars. They said, and this is based on the Qur'an, that there is a preserved tablet, the book of decree we call it, Allah calls it in the Qur'an, Allah al-Mahfuz. In that book of decree it is with Allah. No one knows what is in it. In it is written every single thing that will ever be. And it was written in there 50,000 years before the creation of creation. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. However, the angels are given duties and orders that come out from that book of decree in a manner befitting and known only to Allah. When these angels take it, let's say for example, a person's life is to, a person is to die on this date. The book of decree, the, the, the book of decree has released one qadr. And the angel of death carries that order to go and take your life. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala releases the final qadr, so it's double, a double qadr, from the book of decree, and an order is given to the angel, sabaq al-qadr, the other qadr has beaten this qadr, I have written for this person another lifespan. 
So if you wanted to understand technicalities, it's really to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means just to encourage you that yes, your dua, your goodness to your parents, your connecting with your family ties, and general goodness unto others when you sacrifice and commit for the, in a way that pleases Allah, what was meant to happen to you can be changed. But it's not really changing. It just means that Allah had two destinies for you. And he suspended. He held one destiny based on your action. Why? To show the angels. To show the angels the magnificence of this beautiful worshipper. Number two, to lift your value by your own hands. On the day of judgment, he lifts you and says, this person made dua and connected with me and relied on me. Why would I not, sir, why would I not give him? Why would I not honor him or her? But the other person just didn't do anything, relied on themselves. So I left them to be. I left them to their own actions and to the world. That's it. But today they have nothing. Also to make you feel that you, are, you have a relationship with Allah. It's a two-way thing. It's a two-way thing. Allah wants you to feel connected to Him. It's a two-way thing. That's why Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي If my servants ask you about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am always close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ I will respond to the person who calls upon me if they continue to call upon me. Allah wants you to call upon Him all the time. That is the relationship, the two-way relationship between you and Allah. And Allah has given us this gift that I will change. Well, I had made the decree, but I've held it based on what I know you're going to do. Do you understand? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also says, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يُبْسَطَ لَهُ فِي رِزْقِهِ أَوْ يُنْسَأَ لَهُ فِي أَثَرِهِ فَلْيَصِلْ رَحِمَهِ the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, I just said it before. Whoever would like that his lifespan be expanded and that his risk and his provision be blessed and given more, then let them connect their family ties. Now you might be thinking, what happened to medicine and being healthy and doing exercise and taking precautions because doctors give us advice that you know, there's studies that show that certain parts of the world, they live a healthy lifestyle and studies have shown that they live longer and these ones live shorter. That's also true, my brothers and sisters. Again, all those circumstances are part of Allah's qadr. They're all together intertwined. But added, added to those reasons is dua and being good to your parents and connecting your family ties, just like medicine heals, Allah has created other non-tangible yani, things that you can't, know, you can't touch them, you can't feel them, like acts of goodness to your parents, are also a healing and a medicine. Do you understand? And truly, if you, even if you look at it scientifically and medically, people who have a connection with their parents and their family are happier overall than anyone else who has cut off from their parents or they live in a relationship that is toxic or cut off and so on. Even if it's toxic, they say, get out of it, but still they're not. They wish that their parents were connected. And honestly, when you have Allah and when you know that Allah is telling you, whatever you do good, I will preserve it. I know everything you are doing. Suddenly, you're not only relying on your relationship with your parents, even if it's bad. You know that so long as you are doing good, your heart is at ease. Your soul is at ease. Your mind is at ease if you are a believer in Allah. Why? Because you know your connection with Allah is stronger. And the fact that you are doing this for Allah and it's never going to be lost. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. Some people in their relationship with their parents is lost. It's as if they've got nothing else left. Or with their loved one, their girlfriend or their boyfriend or their wife or their husband or their friend or their children or their whatever it is. When your connection with Allah is stronger, you are able to work through the pain and struggles in life more effectively and better than average and normal people, my brothers and sisters. You can. That is that side as well. So both. Beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, لا يزال القضاء والدعاء يعتلي جانما بين الأرض والسماء. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is in Sahih Ibn Majah. And the Tirmidhi, he said that when you make dua, the qadr, the qadr that is meant to come down, and your dua meet halfway in the sky and they begin to wrestle each other, 
They begin to wrestle each other. One of them beats the other, and the other one is repelled. The stronger your dua, the stronger it is against the primary qadr, which brings the secondary qadr. That Allah already knew. But because of you, because of your work, because of what you did, Allah gives you that control. So why do we make dua anyway? The, the beauty of it is this. It is as a means for having a relationship with Allah, connection, love, hope, humbleness, and all of the emotions between you and God. Number two, dua itself is a created reason and means, means to your provision and what will happen. For example, when we said, don't eat and drink, and it will come to you, you're going to say that's absurd. Same, the dua. Don't make dua and expect, no, make dua. And things will come, inshallah. Number three, as a means, as dua is a means to seek from Allah His extra bounties and gifts to you. It becomes having hope in Him and acknowledging that from Him comes everything. With dua, there is a means of empowerment. And that's why Rasul said, Man lam Whoever does not ask Allah, Allah will be angry with them. Because by making dua, you're acknowledging that Allah is the giver. He is the bounty giver. He is the one who gives everything. So when you don't, it's as if you're saying, Oh Allah, I'm, I don't really trust in you. You've given up on him. Allah gets angry with that. Ask me. Come closer to me, he says. How beautiful. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, There are people who don't get the dua answered because they're hasty. They're hasty. They want it now. They're impatient. They say, Rasulullah, are there these types of people? He says, yes. They go, how? He said, he or she comes to make dua. First time, second time, third time, fourth time. Nothing happens. They give up and they no longer make dua. طيب يا أخي, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to you, don't be hasty. It may be not good for you right now. Just wait. Your prayers, my dear brothers and sisters, are answered. All the time. But instead of saying answered, I'd rather use the word responded to. They won't be exactly as you willed and wished. In fact, the great companions and the scholars used to say, if I don't get what I wanted, I am even happier. Because what I wanted was going to destroy me and my desires are great. But because Allah is in control of my own desires and wants. This is true iman. To really give your life and your... Uh, and your, your entire everything, your destiny is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while doing what you can and relaxing that Allah is on your side my brothers and sisters Allah did say in the Quran وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دَعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ and your Lord said call upon me, I will respond to you in Surah, Al -Gha Surah Ghafir how will he respond to you? In the way Allah wishes and not how we wish. Number two, when Allah wishes and not when you wish. So, what in the way and also when. Number three, so long as it, you are not asking for something forbidden, haram, such as cutting family ties, harm upon somebody and number four so long as your body and your entire life is not nourished all your life with haram haram consumption after consumption haram drinks haram food haram wealth that you live by that's a very important point my brothers and sisters but even that can be reversed with repentance to Allah and changing your ways and watch what happens. Now a lot of people they think of dua and uh, goodness from Allah in materialistic things. Money, food, clothing, you know, the soulmate, house, car, job. No. No. These are temporary enjoyments. And they come and go. And they are not real happiness. They are not real. They, they, they help you, yes. And you can ask Allah for them. But sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you success in hell, in here, in here. 
strength inside of you, determination. You know, all entrepreneurs and experts of finance and money, they always tell you, it all starts with your mindset. Am I right or wrong? It starts with your mindset. Where does a mindset come from? From within. A psychology, a healthy psychology that's within you. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps you with. And some people may say, well, you may say, well, well even non-Muslims have a good psychology. We'll say, yes, but you see, a mu'min, when things go wrong, when all doors are closed, they still have an answer to get out from. Whereas a disbeliever doesn't believe in Allah or anything. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, I've seen some of them become empty, commit suicide, destroy their lives. They don't know where they're going anymore because the hope is gone. If the hope in this world is cut off, at least the believer still has hope of the hereafter. We still have hope and we know why we're here, but the other one has no hope. And sometimes even the disbeliever who doesn't even believe in Allah, when all doors are closed, they themselves find themselves calling upon God. My brothers and sisters, there are three ways Allah responds to your dua. Number one, by actually giving the thing being asked. Number two, or by warding off a harm that would have otherwise afflicted the person. Or number three, or as gifts, gifts awaiting the person in the next life, which is the best form of dua being answered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this hadith is in Musnad Ahmad. So, this is how it works. Rasul sallallahu as we said, he said, how amazing is the believer's affair. Allah decrees nothing for the servant except that it is good for him. That's what the Prophet sallallahu said. Last two questions. If everything is written and decided, why make istikhara? Istikhara. Istikhara is basically a prayer of seeking counsel from Allah. Or in other words, a prayer of seeking guidance on a decision that you are about to make. You don't know which way to go. You want to make a decision one way or the other and you would like Allah's counsel and guidance. There's a prayer for that. It's called istikhara. Tayyib. In Sahih Bukhari, there is a companion named Jabir radiallahu anhu who said, the Prophet peace be upon him used to teach us the istikhara the way he taught us the verses of the Qur'an. That's how amazing it is. And here are its words. Basically, you make wudu, and then you offer two rak'ahs, other than the compulsory ones. So not Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Aisha. Any other two rak'ahs. They can be the sunnah. And then you finish, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And you lift your hands up. Or in your sujood you can do it. You can do that. And then you say, I'll say it in English. It basically starts off, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmika wa astakhiruka bi kudratika. But you can say it in English. Oh Allah, verily I seek the better of either choice from you. By your knowledge. And I seek ability from you. By your power. And I ask you from your immense bounty, for indeed you have power, and I am powerless. You have knowledge, and I, not, I know not. I don't have any knowledge. Yani, I don't know. You are the knower of the unseen realms. Got up to here? Then you say, Oh Allah, if you know that this matter, let's say it's a marriage, let's say it's a job, Let's say it's buying something. Let's say it's selling something. Let's say even tying your shoelace. You can do istikhara for anything. It's not just for serious matters. It can be for anything. So, if, oh Allah, if you know that this matter is good for me, with regard to my religion, with regard to my livelihood, and with regard to my, to my hereafter, and all my affairs, and with regard to all my affairs, then decree it for me. Make it happen for me. Facilitate it for me. Give me the means and the facilities to go about it. And grant me blessing in it. Give me blessings 
through it and with it. Then you say, And if you know that this matter is not good for me with regard to my religion, my livelihood, and the end of my affairs, then turn it away from me and me away from it. And decree for me better than it, wherever it may be, and make me content with it. Make me what? Content with it. This is the problem. This is the problem, that last part. And make me content with it. The other problem is that if you want it and you desire it, and the only reason you're doing this tikhara is hoping you get the better deal based on what you want. This is a problem as well. If you just heard all the words of the istikhara and I read them slowly, if you understood these words, my dear brothers and sisters, this is what you are saying to Allah and you must be in line with that meaning. But unfortunately, we take the first part and reject the rest of the part. So when you come to do an istikhara, my dear brothers and sisters, it means that what you want, you have to put it aside. And you are ready to accept whatever Allah brings out of it. Now, we have another problem. A lot of people put their trust too much in the istikhara and then they get so obsessive afterwards with little nitty gritty obsessive signs. And it makes them crazier if they were already crazy. <laughs> makes you so, go nuts. How? Where? And they come to the sheikh. But this, but they even drive us crazy. Ya akhi, istikhara is not like that. It's not some voodoo or some special divine sign that's going to come down from heaven for you. That's not how istikhara works, ya habibi. Some people, they assume that after they make istikhara, they don't have to do anything. Don't ask, don't investigate, don't get advice, don't research, don't do anything. Just wait for God to give you that sign. Habibi, there is no sign to see or to touch or to feel from istikhara. I'm, sa I'm, sa I'm sorry if I disappointed you. But there's nothing in the sunnah to tell us istikhara has to do that. Some people think you've got to see a dream. Am I right? Everybody, nearly everybody thinks once you make an istikhara, they want to sleep early that night because they think they're going to see a dream. Then they wait. After they see a dream, try and find out what it means. What the heck does it mean? <laughs> what, how are we going to know? You go even crazier. Which way do I go? Then, then you sit down, the shaitan says to you, Oh my God, I did istikhara, Allah's not even helping. Like, Ya Habibi, you're going about it the wrong way. You just read the words. It means you are asking Allah that if it is good for you, open the path for me. Make it in a way that I can go ahead. And then, if it completely closes, that's it. It means that the istikhara worked. So long as there's an opening to it, keep going. Will there be difficulty? Yes. Will there be some obstacles? Of course. Probably from the obstacles, you're going to get a better result. Embrace it. Did you not know that freedom and obstacles are both part of your success? Some people, they make istikhara thinking that they've got to ask a sheikh or some guy or some person they think is pious. I don't know. Maybe they see them wearing something special. It looks like a saint or a kind of monk or something like that. They say, make istikhara for me. Wallahi, there are people who believe this. There are people religious. They fear Allah. They pray five times a day. They've been to Hajj. They abstain from all the haram. And what do they do? My istikhara is with my sheikh. My sheikh's going to make my istikhara. And I'll wait for the sheikh to see a dream. You know how many times the shaitan tricks you left, right and center with this? Sometimes, let's say for example, marriage. Marriage. Sometimes a good sister has come along. A really good one. And you have followed the steps and found out and asked about her and looked at her social media page or the other way around. Sisters looks at the brothers. Hey, women, they are the best at looking at social media pages, guys. I'm telling you. 
They know it better than us. Don't even compete with them on that. All right, so fix yourself first, then ask for a girl. Like fix, I don't mean go wipe off your social media, but well, they've got ways of finding out your history from 100 years ago, if you lived 100 years. I don't know what it is about them, but I ain't going there, man. You guys, don't play that game. They will know the history of your sisters, brothers, daughters, nieces, nephews, daughters, account. <laughs> brothers and sisters. Anyway, just a bit of a humor. When you say you're asking for marriage, she's a good girl. It's good. Someone's compelled. You've done all your research. I've got to ask my sheikh. Well, I've heard this. They go to the sheikh. The sheikh says no because of some dream he had. And then she says no, or he says no. Subhanallah. Is that what the Prophet ﷺ said? Where did you get this from? Doesn't the sheikh also get nightmares? Can't the shaitan come to the sheikh's dreams and also muck up the whole dream? Is the sheikh perfect? The sheikh could have eaten a good meal that night his wife made for him and went to sleep on a very heavy stomach. And his dreams are all over the place. He's still a human, not to make fun of sheikhs, a'udhu billah. Yes, they are, insha'Allah, pious and great. But your istikhara is you. You make the istikhara to you and Allah. Didn't Allah say, say again, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah says, ask me, and I will respond to you. What suddenly we got this Catholic tradition? Go to the priest and confess your sins and go to the... This is the same tradition, ya akhi. I'm not saying you're a kafir or a Christian, but we're taking it from them. On what basis? So my brothers and sisters, istikhara, you make it. Now, here are some tips about istikhara. The scholars generally tell you, before you make the istikhara, research, investigate, and seek advice first. So you see something, an opportunity, and you consider the opportunity, but you haven't made your decision. Before you make the decision to go ahead, you are considering it. Empty your heart, empty your desires, and say, look, I'm ready to accept any outcome, inshallah, and I will do everything in my power. I will do all the materialistic stuff that's needed. I will ask, I will seek advice, I will learn, and then I will make my istikhara. All of it, not just one. After you've investigated, researched, considered, and you've done your whole thing, then finally you say, alhamdulillah, I'm pretty happy so far, or I'm, I'm not sure. Now it's time for me to make the istikhara. Make your istikhara and rely on Allah afterwards and think, okay, let's see, inshallah, I'll keep going the way I was going and by the will of Allah, only the best outcome will come out of this. That's how you do it. Or you do the opposite. You do the istikhara first, once you've considered, and then do your investigation, do your research, seek advice from wiser people, do all that. And then, inshallah, keep going and see how it goes, inshallah ta'ala. But empty your desires. Like, don't sit there and say, I want it. Sometimes, and istikhara is not just for marriage. It's for anything, anything. But, let, but we're just using marriage because everybody can relate to it. Uh, most people do that for marriage. Um, yeah, and he, I know several young people who did uh, istikhara and put their trust too much in it and then waited on some divine supernatural sign. Keep waiting. Keep waiting. It's your fault. You keep waiting and you keep doing that. They come to us, give us a headache, and we say, okay, I'm going to go and research, please. And then what happens? After everything is shown, yani they, they, they see every common sense about them is stay away. Stay away. <laughs> but they want him. Why? Maybe they've been going out in secret. Maybe you're too attached already. Maybe it's because of your desires. Don't try to mix the two. Remember, sometimes we cause it. And then we wait for the istikhara and we ignore, ignore all the red flags, all the signs, everything. Like clear, everyone around us, every wise person says, don't. But no, we do. Then we fall into problems. Yeah, and then we force it. And sometimes the opposite. Do. That brother has got good character. He's got good religion. His Instagram is fine. His parents... Alhamdulillah, I've raised him well. 
You've gone and see how he is with his, with, you know, he's met you with his sisters. He treats his sisters well. They love him. They're not afraid around him. He's not abusive. He loves his mother. His mother loves him. I mean, it's a good sign, inshallah, for you. The person's honest. You've asked about them. Your father, your brothers, your, people, they've, uh, your mother, you've they've asked about him. They've seen what his background is. You've done all that stuff, all those checks. You've looked at yourself and thought, can we be compatible? You've ticked all the boxes. Thought, you know what? Alhamdulillah. And then you make an istikhara. That night the shaitan doesn't want you to marry that person because he knows you'll have a good life or probably get closer to paradise together and then decides to muck up your entire plan. There are three types of dreams, my dear brothers and sisters. They are not my words, they are from the Prophet And I'll finish it with this. The Prophet he said that there are three types of dreams. The one that is from the shaitan to play games with you. And the one from the nafs, your own subconscious mind, and the one from Allah. They said, Ya Rasulullah, about which dream is the sadiq, the truthful one and the right one. And he said some things. He said, number one, the more righteous you are, the more righteous your dreams are. And they're not mixed with other nonsense. The less righteous you are, the more mixed they're going to be. So you might get a dream from Allah, but it will be mixed with your subconscious, with your, um, the shaitan and all that stuff. And there are dreams, he said, sometimes towards the end of time, we live in the end of times now, he said towards the end of time, there are more righteous dreams than ever. He also said the person who is normally honest and trustworthy in their speech and their actions as a personality, as, as, as their character, they are more likely to see righteous dreams too. If you are honest, you'll see honest dreams. Sometimes Rasulullah said, in the depth of the night, some people, it can happen after Fajr, it can happen in the middle of the day, and it can happen for a non-Muslim, or a disbeliever, or a bad person. It can. Fir'aun saw a dream and it was true. And there are, Allah does it for a wisdom. But generally, this is how it happens. But brothers and sisters, most of the time we see dreams that are from our subconscious mind or from the shaitan. The shaitan comes in and maybe that night will tell you, show you that, that person in an ugly form. You wake up terrified and you see, I don't want to marry that person. Even all the signs were good and you've just, you, just, you just stopped yourself from someone righteous. Sometimes your subconscious mind. Let's say you already love that person. You already decided. The istikhara is not going to work for you if you've already decided. You'll see a dream. You're going together, you're going into a gate that looks like paradise, you've both got wings, you're flying, and then you say, wow, look at that. We both look like unicorns. You wake up and go, I can't stop thinking about her or him. Is that the istikhara or is that before the istikhara, you've already made up your mind and you've already attached, and you've already been talking, you've already been, you know, some people up to hanky-pankies, <laughs> some people already... You know what I mean? Lots of messages and, uh, you know, memes and I don't know what. Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Oh, come on. Stop your sleaziness. Stop this cringiness. Brothers and sisters, istikhara, you have to empty those emotions and not make a decision from before and empty your desires. Make the istikhara before you do something. Okay? That's how you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, finally, uh, so we said, let me repeat, this tikhara does not mean you're going to see a dream necessarily or asking a sheikh necessarily or divine signs necessarily or divine feelings. But there is something about your heart. If you find a consistent feeling in your heart that is positive and you have taken all the proper measures and you've done your istikhara, this is even an extra good sign. But if you find a consistent negative feeling right then you need to investigate more but don't just rely on one without the other okay sometimes people have a mental illness and they've always got a negative feeling some people have got a mental illness and they've also always got a positive feeling about everything even the bad things so you got to check yourself and make sure that it's not something that you've carried on from before that you know it's just now it hasn't been always before. But this is too philosophical and psychological for me at the moment. So we'll just stop there insha'Allah ta'ala and I think for today we will end our third class.
on qada and qadar. I hope, insha'Allah, today you have benefited and learned something new. And I hope, insha'Allah, I was clear. Uh, I tried my best. Uh, and whatever I made, if there was a mistake from me, it's from myself, not from Allah. And whatever was good and right is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, make dua for us. Thank you for listening. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين <تصفيق>